Have you ever wondered what your dreams mean? Join us in Dream School at thisjungianlife.com and find out. Jung wrote, Dreams are a little hidden door in the innermost and most secret recesses of the soul. Dream School is a unique, self-paced online program you can start at any time that unlocks access to your inner world. Our 12-month program provides the support, knowledge, and guidance you need to reach within, decipher your personal dream code, and harness it to optimize your life. By enrolling, you'll join an affirming community of fellow travelers, each pursuing a unique quest. And it's fun. Join us on an adventure to wholeness and healing through understanding your dreams. Go to thisjungianlife.com and click on Dream School. You'll be taken to our secure checkout. Once you join, you'll get immediate access to our first three modules. You can get started right away. We look forward to seeing you there. Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. This week we're going to be talking about failure. What is failure? There's a subjective quality to failure so that an experience that might feel like a failure to one person might just feel like a minor course correction to someone else. What happens to us when we experience failure? How does it affect us psychologically? And uh, what can failure teach us? So these are some of the subjects that we're going to be circumambulating this week and looking at through a Jungian frame. I find myself thinking about the Latin root of the word, which is uh, felere, which means to trip, to cause to fall or to stumble or stagger. And that's an interesting way of thinking that the ego is on a journey, it's set its destination, it feels like it's moving that way, and something or other intercedes and causes a fateful stumbling. It's not uncommon, I think we all have this universal experience, but there's a challenge as to what we're going to make of that. We could become traumatized by that and then wind up with a failure complex and then it has its own self-fulfilling prophecy. But there are other Jungian lenses that might be more helpful. Seems to me that we are in the realm of ego. Lisa, you saying it's a subjective state, and Joseph, you sort of alluding to the meaning that we make of it. Uh, and those are ego functions of uh, what has happened to me? What do I make of it? You know, is this my fault? Was it bad luck? Uh, did I misjudge, uh, miscalculate something? Do I feel embarrassed or exposed somehow? These are all things that our ego state uh, does for us, that meaning-making function. And, and so it seems to me that failure has a lot to do with our ego functioning. Joseph, I, I just want to pick up on on something that you were just talking about, about, you know, that which sort of gets in our way as we're going along our ego journey. And it calls to mind this incredible quote from Jung, where he says, to this day, God is the name by which I designate all things which cross my willful path violently and recklessly all things which upset my subjective views, plans, and intentions, and change the course of my life for better or for worse. So in some sense, what Jung is saying here is that failure is God. And I, I uh, think that that's kind of a radical proposition, but there's really some 
truth to it. I mean, failure is that which punctures our inflated fantasies of omnipotence. And it's through failure that we come to know the limitations of our ego and become acquainted with constraint. And failure relativizes the ego and makes us aware of our dependence on the unconscious, or as Jung might say, our dependence upon God. I also think it's so important in the quote that Jung starts by saying, to this day, God is the name by which I designate. And, and it's easy to just kind of slip past that. But what we can see is that Jung has made a choice. And the choice is to frame his life events in such a way that the transpersonal has a role in it. And that decision is profoundly significant. It leans into a philosophy that Jung believed in and believed that it helped human beings to function in the world, both inner and outer. I believe that quote is uh, comes from answer to Job, does it not? I believe so, yeah. And so there is another way that it relativizes uh, the ego, that the answer to Job was, this is the way it is. There is something greater that does not conform to your ideas of what's right or wrong from our mortal ego perspective. It's really a very powerful call to acknowledge that we are not uh, the kings of our own selves or the queens, that what we think from our ego perspective uh, is not the ultimate reality. Well, and, and Deb, you were talking before about the, the need to kind of approach failure with a strong ego and and i think that that leans into something that you're both saying which is to be able to take this view of it to let failure instruct us this deeply and allow it to change us and to in a sense submit to failure not to uh give in to a tendency to ruminate about how we are failures which in fact can be kind of a defense against the true deep experiencing of the failure. You know, if we're just sort of wringing our hands and letting ourselves see ourselves, our sense of self-worth and our life through the lens of failure, in some sense that's keeping us away from the powerful recognition that uh, a failure may open into a new experience, a new attitude, a new way of understanding ourselves. But to do that, we, we do definitely need a strong ego. And failure has a very important role to play in developing a strong, uh, well-adapted, and realistic ego. The task here and failure can be uh, painfully but well instructive in helping us to learn to survive reality. And uh, I'll tell a story about when I went off to college. Um, I somehow had gotten the idea that, that I would be a linguist. And that because I had taken both French and Spanish, and we're talking high school uh, foreign language classes, but off I went to college, and I took a double course in Russian, which I, at the end of the semester, had solidly, roundly, and unequivocally failed. <laughs> <laughs> because I had the idea that somehow there was a natural talent there, uh, maybe it would come fairly easily, things should come fairly easily. And so th that part of my belief system was shattered. And the dean uh, called me in uh, because the rest of my grades were far from stellar as well. And that was a real coming to terms with, I had to work harder. I had to drop my fantasy of being a linguist and uh, hunker down and be more in line with what I really could do 
and face my own ordinariness mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. as as a student. But paradoxically, that failure, uh, of course, was instructive. It was a necessary corrective, and it helped me build a more realistic sense of self, a more realistic orientation to the world, and certainly a new attitude about um, how much more time I was going to have to spend hitting the books. Yeah, so it was this bumping up against this fantasy, perhaps, that school was going to come easily. You know, I'm thinking about the research that's been done on things like mindset and the role of failure in kind of creating resilience and in and confidence. And I know that there's, I think in corporate America, there's this sort of uh, dictum to fail faster or, or fail harder or something like that. And and the point is, you know, sort of almost like sort of like failure is good, you know, because we, we want we want to be able to. Um, be able to absorb those experiences of failure and then learn from them and that that can be a tremendously generative process. And of course, from that standpoint, you know, failure can be really instructive because when we fail, we can go back and say, okay, what, what didn't work about this? I mean, thinking of, you know, Wilbur and Orville Wright. So they try to fly a plane and it doesn't fly. So they go back and they try to figure out what's wrong and they, they tinker with it and they go again. And this time something else goes wrong. And, and and so obviously failure can be really instructive in that sense, but but I I'm also interested in how it can a, a sort of a deeper kind of education that failure can bring this this uh, what I referred to before the relativization of the ego and um, thinking of Jung saying that um, success is actually imperils a man psychologically because it makes him forget his dependence on the unconscious. So framing what the world would call a failure in the right way makes us resilient. To be able to find the pearl in the silt or in the ashes, if I think of the book of Job. But when we talk about taking refuge in the self and to understand that there are forces greater than our ego that are at work, both in terms of our own libido and conceptualization of the goal. There are forces at work in terms of both the environment and how other people are relating to our attempt to create the goal. And it invites us to find the right attitude in the movement towards the goal, regardless of its attainment. In one way, this brings me a little bit to the Bhagavad Gita and to Karma Yoga. So it, it was thought in the ancient Indian world that people were born into certain circumstances by virtue of failure and sin and error made in other lives, and that they needed to stay within that strata of society and suffer the outcomes of it with the hope that a purification would occur. But one of the dispensations that rises out of the Krishna story in the Mahabharata is that even those who work, who are not in the priest class, can still attain enlightenment if they could cultivate the feeling thought idea that all impulse to work rises from Krishna all the energy to engage the work rises and is gifted from Krishna, and all of the results of one's labor is also offered to Krishna. And that transpersonal attitude, the feeling that there are higher forces than the ego that are at work, was thought to be a path to enlightenment. This feeling that the self, the divine is the generator and the receiver of the fruits of human efforts shifts something. It moves the outcomes and even the process away from an exclusively personal 
interpretation to a place where we are part of a larger universe. Well, so it it sacralizes our efforts. And I think it also aids us in maturing because it makes the context within which we live our lives more complex, uh, which is very different from just the ego stance of what I wanted and maybe I failed or maybe I succeeded, but that is in the realm of I. And this other idea that you've just alluded to of a greater context uh, makes our world more complex and what happens to us is more complex. There are other forces beyond just I, me, my thoughts, my meaning, my goals, my, my to consider something larger at work. And the larger could be the self, but the larger can also be humanity as a whole. And I have a slightly lengthy quote from Jung where he talks about this, and he writes, In the case of psychological suffering, which always isolates the individual from the herd of so-called normal people, it is also of the greatest importance to understand that the conflict is not a personal failure only, but at the same time a suffering common to all and a problem with which the whole epoch is burdened. This general point of view lifts the individual out of himself and connects him with humanity. The suffering does not even have to be a neurosis. We have the same feeling in very ordinary circumstances. If, for instance, you live in a well-to-do community and you suddenly lose all your money, your natural reaction will be to think that it's terrible and shameful and that you are the only one who is such an ass as to lose his money. But if everybody loses his money, then it's quite a different matter, and you feel reconciled to it. When other people are in the same hole as I am, I feel much better. If a man is lost in the desert or quite alone on a glacier, or if he is the responsible leader of a group of men in a precarious situation, he will feel terrible. But when he is a soldier in a whole battalion that is lost, he will join the rest in cheering and making jokes and will not realize the danger. The danger is not less, but the individual feels quite differently about it in a group than when he has to face it alone. So the group could be the self and the group could be humanity. There's so much in that quote, Joseph. And, and one of the things that, that popped up for me is his reference to shame. And I, I do think that a lot of times when we fail, it brings up an experience of shame. And that is why it's very normalizing and humanizing to recognize that other people fail too. That's why, you know, if we got a terrible grade on an exam, we, we want to know, you know, what did everyone else get? And if half the class failed, we feel much, much better. So that shame is a, is a big part of failure. And that we have to fight to not get sucked into the illusion that it is only I in this deep, dark hole of failure. But that's not really true if we think about it in a more fulsome way. Well, you know, I think failure is likely to throw us into a complex. And we know that complexes alter our perception of ourselves and the world around us. And in general, I always tell my clients that it's not a good idea to think too much when you're in a complex, because you're not going to think clearly. So after we've had a, a major failure and we're feeling really downcast, we're likely to come to decisions about what it means. That, for example, we, we're terrible, we're, we're stupid, we're never going to be able to do it, no one likes us, whatever. And, and it's like, well, maybe give it some time before you decide what's true about this. Don't don't make too many decisions about what this means because 
because you're in a complex right at that moment, and you're not going to be thinking clearly. So when I think about the failure complex, there's a couple of aspects to it that I wonder about. That when we develop a failure complex, the same goal suddenly seems less attainable. So for instance, they did a bit of research with football players, and they compared football players who are able to kick the ball through the goalpost to football players that failed to kick the ball through the goalpost. And the two things they measured were the perception of the player as to how high the goalpost was and how far away it was. And players who failed to kick the ball through the goalpost estimate that the goalpost was higher and further away. And, and what that tells us is that when we're in a failure complex, it actually affects the way we interpret the natural world. It actually changes how we perceive what the task even is. That complex also can distort your perceptions of your abilities. It can make us feel like abilities that have served us well previously suddenly have no value or I have absolutely no skill. The complex can make you believe that you're helpless. Yes, it's a kind of narcissistic wound because the ego didn't do what it claimed it would do. But we can multiply that and then take on failure as a kind of identity. And the unconscious fear of failure can lead to a kind of perfectionism that can be really crippling. Fearing failure can leave us to self-sabotage so that we just extricate ourselves from the entire context. Fear of failure can be transmitted from parents to children. It can cause a lot of anxiety. What I'm aware of is uh, how much of failure seems to be determined by the external world of, you know, did I kick that ball through the goalposts? Uh, did I get an A in the course? Did I get a pay raise, a promotion? And in the first stage of life, while we're developing, adapting, and developing a, a good, well-developed ego, of course we're measuring ourselves against external world standards, people, approval, reactions, all the rest of it. And yet it can also become a kind of fatal flaw that if what happens out there determines what happens inside me, whether I did well or didn't, uh, at some point that is really a false measure of success or failure. And I think uh, young people, people in their 20s that I've worked with, you know, often have to overcome this, especially, you know, in college or first or second jobs of that, wait a minute, you know, my idea that I presented at the staff meeting might have been a great idea, even though my boss hated it. Uh, my idea on this paper might have been a really great idea even though the other person, the evaluator, my professor didn't like it. Uh, we have to start to internalize our own values and our own standards, what we want and what are we in it for, whether it's work or study or child rearing or anything else that we do. You know, what, what are our own real internal values and standards? Deb, I think that that's such a key point, right? And it's to what extent does our sense of self get wrapped up in whether or not we succeed? So I think that failure is often a challenge to the persona. And if we're very, very invested in, in our persona and in and kind of being that version of ourselves, failure can just be devastating because it, it seems like it just erases who we are. I mean, I would also say that that's a moment of real possibility because it will wipe away this kind of false per persona identification. And then we'll have to figure out, okay, so I'm not going to be a concert pianist or whatever. So, or I'm not going to be a linguist. 
So who am I going to be? It kind of creates this opportunity for a confrontation with ourself. But certainly that sense of just a kind of total loss of identity can really come about with failure. And it makes me think of, um, I was trying to think of films that deal with failure. And and one of the ones that came to mind is this uh, 2004 German film that's in English is called Downfall. And it's about Hitler's last days in the bunker. And it's just an incredible film. But you know, talk about a failure. You know, this this was, uh, you know, the 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 Allied forces were closing in on Berlin, and uh, you know, you kind of watch Hitler come to grips with the fact that it's all up, it's all over. One of the things that happens in the film is a, a lot of the people in the bunker decide that they're going to commit suicide, and and obviously it's to avoid you know, capture, punishment, or that kind of thing. Goebbels, uh, Magda and Joseph Goebbels, um, you see in the film, there are five, I think it's their five, you know, lovely blonde children. They're injected with morphine, and then later on the parents crush cyanide capsules in their mouth. And it's because the parents cannot imagine their children growing up in a world without the Fuhrer. That's what we're told in the film. And so this sense that I cannot survive a failure, I cannot, my sense of who I am in the world will not survive this degree of challenge to who I, who I thought I was. So failure can impact and eradicate a sense of identity. And if one's sense of identity is linked to something as absolutely awful as living under the Fuhrer, then failure is going to be catastrophic. And as you mentioned in the film, it will it will lead to this kind of infanticide and uh, suicide. I'm also thinking about failure as trauma. Uh, when failure impacts our whole sense of self, Oh, uh, that it's so overwhelming that it's almost as if the I isn't there anymore. And that, I think, is the specter perhaps looming behind or underneath the failure of, will I still be here? Will I be able to recover uh, f- from this terrible impact? Or will the unconscious, you know, those horrible ghosts and fears from uh, when we were all very young, very small, very dependent, and very helpless, you know, will they rise up and engulf me? Well, well, Deb, I think you're you're raising a fabulous point, and I I imagine that if you looked at um, suicide, perhaps especially among young men, you might often find that uh, a failure is a precursor. And I think it goes just right to what you're saying, that there's a, and I want to say a fantasy that we won't be able to survive, that the I will be wiped out by the failure. But I'm I'm going to push back a little bit at your use of the word trauma to describe that. Because I, th- I think the fear is that it's going to wipe us out. The truth is it's not and that if we can stay the course, even in the misery of the failure and the humiliation, perhaps, that what is there for us is a new opportunity to really know ourselves, not as we think we should be, not as our parents wish we were, not as some external rubric says that we should be, but but really what's inside of us and what matters to us. And I don't think that failing is the same thing as trauma. And we can survive failure in in almost every case that I can think of. And in fact, I think that failure breeds resilience. You know, I'm thinking of um, my younger kid as a chess player, and he's not a great chess player. He loses a lot, and he always has. And and it's it's been, I think, so good for him because he he knows how to fail. You know, and and uh, that's one of the main things he's gotten from chess is that he's I mean he's gotten lots of other good things too, but boy, he's really good at failing, 
And and that's a wonderful thing to be good at, actually, because, you know, it's that's the only way that we're going to get resilience. And I think I feel somewhat passionate about this because I have so many, um, say, mothers in my practice who have young adult children who have never been allowed to fail. And so then failure really does look catastrophic, you know, with this kind of um, cultural mindset these days of this kind of, you know, snowplow parenting, where kids are often not allowed to fail. And uh, I have empathy for parents who want to clear the path for their kids and ensure that they don't struggle. But I'm also seeing the result in my office of these kids who truly are so fragile because they've never faced failure before. And if we were to take the word failure and replace it with learning, that so much learning is avoided when children are not allowed to make an appropriate failure, a reasonable failure. I think there are two sides uh, to this, probably, as ever. And I agree with everything you've said, Lisa, about you know, sort of not identifying uh, with failure that, uh, you know, I failed a course or lost a chess match or whatever else it might be, that, that I am not that, and it breeds uh, resilience. And I think I also want to go back to the idea that in trauma, what can happen is the incursion of the unconscious can even, and we hope temporarily, engulf the ego. And that that is a very different feeling state from, oh, gee whiz, my team depended on me kicking the field goal and I missed. And to recognize how powerful that can be, I want to recognize how powerful the unconscious can be in this place of, of feeling like a failure. And then to hold the thought that this will pass, I can get support, this is not all, to somehow sit through that storm. But I do want to recognize that an affective state like that can be incredibly powerful. I absolutely agree, and and I'm still not sure that I would call that trauma, but we can take that up in another episode. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's uh, affect that the ego is not able to bear. It's overwhelming affect, for exactly. sure. Exactly, overwhelming affect, and failure can have that. And just know uh, that that's the way it feels now, and sit through it. And then later on, uh, find the resilience, find some support, find a way to be curious about it, find a way to learn from it. But it's sometimes hard to do in the moment. Yeah. And, you know, it, it sort of brings me back to what you were talking about a minute ago, Joseph, about fear of failure and how that can really constrict us. So there, there is something about welcoming failure or, or at least making friends with it. <laughs> well, if we think of failure and, and we pare it down a bit as quite simply not attaining the ego's goal or decision, and, and that's all that it means. Now, there's a lot of nuance to that. For instance, the goal that I, the ego, have set may be something that was imposed upon me, that my school system told me I should do this, my parents told me, my church told me. So sometimes we are colonized by outside entities of one form or another so that the goal is not actually something that I want. And so therefore, I seem to be moving towards the goal, but really my whole organism is wanting something else and that as I approach the fork in the road where my true desire versus complying with the culture, for instance, come to crisis, oftentimes we will sabotage, self-sabotage the goal because it really was not something we wanted, not truly. 
and we'll find excuses, we'll justify it, we'll do all kinds of stuff to not be saddled with an outcome that we actually don't want. So it takes a lot of discernment and honesty with oneself to really sink down and analyze this thing that we're calling a failure. That's so great. And it, and it brings to mind, you like years later, maybe you think, oh my God, thank God I didn't get into law school. You know, it's like, then I would never have done this thing that's been so meaningful to me, you know, because it's like, well, if I'd gotten into law school, of course I would have gone because, you know, that's so prestigious or whatever. But like the failure actually created these opportunities. This brings me back to the crucial importance of self-reflection and particularly what your values, whoever the you might be in this are you in it for status, money, power, fame, approval? The list goes on and on. But as long as what a person is engaged in is dependent upon that kind of thing, failure does take on all those earmarks of, of a kind of self-sabotage because we're not really in sync with what our true nature is what our true destiny is, what we're really made for. And the, the joy and the meaning and the purpose of doing something that is truly integral to our own sense of self. And I think that's huge, is the call to, wait a minute, what am I doing this for? What is it that I really want from this? Am I here to serve something authentic in myself? Or am I chasing after fame, glory, money, approval? It takes me back to what Jung, Jung saying that it's dangerous to be too successful in life because then you don't have that opportunity to kind of ask these questions and, and know more about yourself. And, you, you know, it, it's it, failure does definitely teach us the limits of our conscious attitude and instructs us to rely on the, the instinctual or the irrational. And, and there, you know, there's so many fairy tales that feature failure as a part of them. And one of them that came to mind for me is the Russian story of the firebird. And, and I'm just going to read just the very beginning of it because it's a long and twisty tale, but and it'll give you a sense. A king's apple tree bore golden apples, but every night one was stolen. Guards reported that the firebird stole them. The king told his two oldest sons that the one who caught the bird would receive half his kingdom and be his heir. They drew lots to see who would be first, but both fell asleep. They tried to claim the bird had not come, but an apple was missing. Finally, Ivan, the youngest son, asked to try. His father was reluctant because of his youth and also because he was known for being a lazy no good Nick, but at last he consented. Ivan remained awake the entire time and upon seeing the bird tried to catch it by the tail. Unfortunately, Ivan only managed to grasp one feather. The firebird did not return, but the king longed for the bird because it was so beautiful. He said that whichever of his sons caught it would have half his kingdom and be his heir. The older brother set out. They came to a stone that said, whoever took one road would know hunger and cold. Whoever took the second would live, though his horse would die. And whoever took the third would die, though his horse would live. They did not know which way to take. So they took up an idle life. They did nothing. Ivan begged his father to be allowed to go until his father yielded. He took the second road and a wolf ate his horse. Ivan walked until he was exhausted and then the wolf offered to carry him. And it goes on and on like that. But where the two older brothers fail, Ivan succeeds. And this is, of course, often the way in fairy tales. And the two older brothers represent the kind of dominant conscious attitude, the, the way we are used to moving through the world. And when the normal way that we move through the world fails us, when the, the normal attitude that we bring to problem doesn't work anymore, 
then we're, we, we fall back on the unconscious and we have to know some new part of ourselves. So I'm thinking of a man, for example, who maybe is, you know, kind of successful in, in the outer world. He's got a, you know, a good job and he does well. And he, and he's kind of been living his life for decades, according to certain precepts and understandings of things. And then, you know, one day his, his, his wife turns around and faces him and says, you know, look, we've got a major problem in our marriage and I'm thinking about leaving, you know, then he's, he's got to know some other part of himself, the, the part of himself that gets along fine at work and can do his job every day is not going to carry him through this next challenge. And he must learn some new part of himself in order to meet that challenge. So our failures, if they are linked to the soul, to the psyche, are ways that we can be motivated to grow. And when we are comfortable, we generally don't have a motivation to grow. That there needs to be some kind of fuel, some level of suffering, small or great, that mobilizes us to escape that suffering. And ideally, we would find a way to enlarge the personality, to engulf the suffering with a greater attitude, with wisdom. And when we can adopt that attitude, then our failures become our severe teachers that we could one day come to appreciate and even bless. One of the ways that Alfred Adler tried to help people step outside of this failure complex. And Adler was one of the three big early psychoanalysts, Freud, Jung, and Adler, is that he encouraged people to think of their activities as a form of dancing, that I'm dancing my undergraduate degree, or I am dancing my application for that new job. I'm dancing this first date with so-and-so. And that by framing it as a kind of dance, it immediately takes people into an, unus an unusual use of language so that they're not uh, leaning into their habitual uh, style of framing it. But also, by calling it dancing, it suggests that the dance can become more skilled over time, like any other form of dance. And that as we become more skilled, the dancing becomes less effortful or more aesthetic. And I think that there's something ancient about the archetype of dancing. In the end of the minor arcana of the tarot cards, key 21 or card 21, the world has a dancing androgyne which is an old view of divinity. It shows up in one of the old, I believe it's a shaker hymn, the Lord of the Dance. But even before that, there is a Gnostic hymn. It's been around for a long time. And at the end of the hymn, the Christ figure in this play announces to his disciples, but as for me, if thou wouldst know who I was, in a word, I am the Logos who did dance all things and was not ashamed at all. It was I who leaped and danced. Strive to understand the all. And so to think of God as the dancer, and that we, made in that reflection, are also small dancers, and that every effort that we are applying is also a kind of dance that can be improved, but also it's just a dance. And the dance does not need to leave you shamed. It points to acting from a sense of inner authenticity. Uh, rather than from ego-oriented goals. It's really lovely, a dance 
for the joy of it, for self-expression, be part of the great round. And so maybe this is a time to talk about a dream. And every time we bring up our dream interpretation portion, I moved to remind our listeners that we have a dream school, an online learning opportunity where you can join us and learn how to interpret your own dreams. Jung gives us a wealth of wisdom. He gives us steps and insights and examples, and the three of us do the same, to help coach people in how to grasp these obscure symbols and themes in our dream and to put them to good use, to help reorient our waking personality to include some of these deep images and movements of life force. And when we align with those deeper currents inside of us, life often becomes more meaningful. And once in a while, it also becomes easier. So if that's interesting to you, hop on over to the website, thisunionlife.com, click on Dream School, and just read about it. And if you have any questions, send us an email. Hey, Lisa, what's been going on about your book? Well, as you know, my book, Motherhood, Facing and Finding Yourself, was published in May of 2021 by Sounds True. And since it's been published, I've been feeling most excited and grateful reading the reviews for the book on Amazon and Goodreads. It makes me realize that this journey, which began as a challenging personal inquiry for me, has become a real healing force for many. Motherhood won the Parenting and Family category of the Best Book Awards this year through the American Book Fest, which has been exciting too. But what really feels nourishing to me as an author is hearing what's happening on the ground in people's hearts. And so many people have written to me on email or on social media and let me know how much the book has meant to them. And there's just nothing more gratifying than that, than to hear that the book has meant so much to so many people. So Motherhood is available wherever books are sold in paperback, ebook, and audio formats. And I hope everyone who's meant to dive into the well of its lessons can do so. And I so appreciate hearing from people what they think of it. So keep the emails and the letters and the comments coming. I, they mean a lot to me. There's also a free course that's related to the book and a book excerpt on my author website, which is lisamarciano.com. And I encourage all of our listeners to check it out. So thank you for asking, Joseph. I'm just uh, so happy for you and it's such a lovely lovely book both deep and accessible about the inner journey around being a mother it's never been written about it hasn't been out there and it's getting such an enthusiastic heartfelt reception it's wonderful yeah i would love it if listeners who've read the book could write a review on amazon because <laughs> although there are many wonderful ones there um, more is always better. So thanks in advance for that. You've really incarnated something that was in the ethers, but needed to be pulled down, needed to be shaped in words, and needed to be made accessible. Mm -hmm. And the proof in the pudding is that it's beginning to have a kind of life of its own in the collective. <laughs> yes. And that speaks a lot to the timeliness of this. Yeah, I think you're right, Joseph. The analogy to a baby is just too rich and too good and too multifaceted to be <laughs> missed. <laughs> it's having a life of its own, which yeah. is just what we want. That's mm. right. Today's dreamer is a 47-year-old man who works as a data scientist. And he writes, A woman like my wife, but more mysterious and mischievous, and I were given a mission. The sun was setting and we were told that if we traveled toward the sunset, or rather, since we were to leave in the morning, with the rising sun to our backs, we would reach Norway. 
We came to a narrow, concealed canyon with train tracks, and the woman caused a cave-in that forced the train to stop. It was carrying some sort of ore. We met the crew without raising their suspicions, and they took us through the canyon's closed, concealed entrance into their country. One of the crew pointed out in the distance a harbor full of the end product of the ore, beautifully and skillfully crafted boats. You had to be a citizen of their country to own one, but people from all around the world came to rent them. He then took us into a wood-paneled room, like a club from Edwardian England, and showed us a rapier and broadsword, also made from the ore. As he demonstrated how to use and care for them, I felt intimidated or unsure about being able to use them myself. For context, he adds, in the last two years I've completely changed careers and left the high-demand religion I've been in all my life. My wife and I have just started couples therapy. He adds that he felt eagerness for the mission, worry about getting caught sneaking into the country, awe for the boats, intimidated about using the swords. So I have to say that this is kind of a prima materia dream in as much as the ore Mm -hmm. is this initial that's substance that's kind of pulled out of the bowels of the earth and all kinds of rather miraculous and and valuable things are eventually made from the ore the ore that's inside of him yeah that's that's great joseph and it's wonderful that he catches these glimpses of the things the ore can become in the dream it's like a little promise from psyche in that distant harbor all these beautiful boats you know, it strikes me that this, I mean, it's a lovely dream, and it strikes me that it's very much a midlife dream. And this uh, dreamer has been going through some big shifts. He's left his religion, he's changed his careers, and now he and his wife are renegotiating their relationship and couples counseling. And I noticed that he says that uh, the sun was setting. And in fact, uh, they have to uh, put the sunrise to their backs to complete this mission effectively, which is very much what we have to do at midlife. We have to acknowledge that, that we're on the downward part of the slope. Maybe we're at the very top of the downward part of the slope, but nevertheless, there we are. And we have to kind of come to terms with that and embrace it, which it seems to me that this, the, the psyche of this dreamer is, is willing to take that on and willing to take on this kind of sunset mission, as it were, head toward the sunset. What do you guys make of the woman causing the cave-in and blocking the train? Because the ore holds all of this kind of potential, but continuing to access or mine the ore or get it to the processing plant has been decisively stopped by the anima figure. Well, I'm thinking that this is a little bit equivocal, and I, I think I see the sun setting and sun rising a little differently, too. Uh, so we have the anima figure, who is mysterious and mischievous, uh, and also sort of an image of the wife, but with more life force. Now, the sun on maybe the first half of life is setting, and they're told if they travel toward the sunset, but if they leave in the morning with the rising sun, the new beginning. And I would be very interested in what Norway is to the dreamer. And of course, historically, especially during World War II, it was such a force of resistance uh, to the encroachment of, of Hitler's takeover of Europe. The woman then causes a cave-in, and the train was carrying the ore. So they have to sort of sneak in to the country. So it looks like in the storyline here, the ore in the train does not make it into the country, but they do get to see all these wonderful things that are made from ore that has previously arrived in the country. I think it's an interesting question about the role of the anima, because I think 
one way that that you could read it, Joseph, is is sort of what you're saying about, um, you know, that the, the anima has sort of decisively stopped the flow of this incredibly important resource. But mm-hmm. it's been a resource that's only been in the unconscious until now. And stopping the train, I think, allows the couple to board the train and to become acquainted with the crew and to see the ships in the distance in the harbor. And so I wonder if it isn't one of those disruptions that kind of needs to happen so that something can become more conscious. I'm also thinking that it's the train that is stopped as a a kind of ego function and uh, all this big apparatus uh, that's automated and the way that the dream ego and is and the woman get into the country, they have to go on foot. They met the crew without raising suspicions, and the crew takes us through the canyon's closed, concealed entrance into the country. Uh, you you have to go in a more personal, humble, step by step way. This reminds me a little bit of kind of like the Grail legend where you have the vision of the Grail and and then you have to go on your own very careful uh, lifelong search for it. And I'm interested that what he sees is that the end product of the ore is beautifully and skillfully crafted boats. And I think boats are such a wonderful image of the relationship of the ego to the unconscious, of these crafted, culturally constructed ego vessels that allow us to float on the great unconscious, on the deeps of psyche. And that there's there's the grail. And you can rent them. But if you want to own them, you have to belong to the country. So there's another process of uh, repatriation, as it were. Mm. It reminds me of the mythology of Shangri-La, that there's a fictional place in the Kunlun Mountains that was made famous in 1933 with a novel called The Lost Horizon, and that Shangri-La is this mystical, harmonious valley that is gently guided by a lamasari. The humans there live for hundreds of years in a kind of Edenic paradise. And it feels like that archetype has been evoked. So, building on what you had said about the anima figure, we could imagine that she is in her linking function that even though it looks like she's stopped something and she has, or maybe has slowed it down, she also has facilitated a linking between the dream ego and the agents of the ore, as well as them being invited into this Shangri-La. And it's clear that they're not citizens and they don't have the rights of citizens, but they are allowed ingress and egress. They are allowed an opportunity to rent a boat and to have some relationship with this idyllic and magical world, which could be the the start of a new vision for this person's life. I, I also think the new vision is absolutely depicted toward uh, the end of the dream, that after having the vision of the boats, then the dream ego is guided into a wood-paneled room and shown a rapier and a broadsword, also made from the ore. And as their guide demonstrates how to use and care for them, the dream ego says, I felt intimidated and unsure about how to use them myself. And there's the journey of then you're going to have to take them by the handle Uh, use these weapons of aggression, of ego, of battle, uh, in a metaphorical sense, of that that may be the work in the world uh, that the dream maker is pointing to, of your your journey, of being a soldier, of able to wield weaponry and, and use it for your own aggressive 
pursuit of your right life path. And that fits given that he says he's uh, separated from uh, his high demand religion. So now he makes his own way in the world. And for that, you do need aggression. I mean, I thought it was the, interesting that the dream presented him with an image of not one sword, but two, <laughs> two different kinds of swords. As yes. a, you know, to really kind of underscore the point. And of course, swords carry with it this sense of aggression. And they also carry with it a sense of the clarifying power of the rational mind, that which is discerning, that which can cut one thing from another. And of course, you know, let's let's just say it out loud, uh, swords are phallic. So this also may have something to do with him really grasping his masculine power. I appreciate it that the guide is showing him not just how to use the swords, but how to care for them. So there, there's a real kind of incorporation and integration of this energy. And it's not, it's not just going to be wielded, it's going to be... Um, welcomed. Swords can also represent the capacity to discriminate one thing from another. That if we think of swords as cutting things into pieces, that they're associated with a way that the intellect can function to break things down into their component parts and to come to some kind of clarity about those relationships. So the boat represents a whole thing often I think an image of the ego, being able to float on the unconscious. So the prima materia might allow this fellow to build a new set of attitudes with which to move through his life, or to move above the unconscious as the waking life does. And that although he's shy and intimidated about taking the rapier and broadsword with him, he does need to have them in order to be able to parse things, to make important and significant discriminations, particularly in this new career he's had and this redesign of his relationship with his wife. So discriminations, rather than leaving everything in a big masa confusa, is always helpful and clarifying. You've been listening to This Jungian Life, from our website, thisunionlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this union life.